what does the, the future hold for us? Well, I think this has uh, probably been a very anticipated event. It's so important that Washington get together and deal with immigration issues because we have these skirmishes and these, you know, these events that um, are not beneficial to anybody. Well, definitely we're anxiously waiting for the president-elect to take office. Uh, we've been following that for during the campaign, and uh, it'll be a different form of government, definitely. It's critical that we understand the concerns that may arise as there's a new administration for the uh, energy sector. Uncertainty will also add in place a uh, burden on our investors, uh, uh, placing their funds, their investment on hold versus investment as we ensure that uh, we, as our partners ensure that they continue to invest, there needs to be certainty. So there are concerns. Well, you know, there's a lot of changes that are happening. And so I think some of the fear is that people just don't know. And so the fact that we were able to bring somebody down and to try to lay things down in a very strategic way and empower them with information, I think that lessens the fear a little bit. So they're more clear about what they think they need to do. Uh, I think Duncan Wood uh, tells it exactly how he sees it and he, he does not, uh, it was an impressive presentation because it don't, he doesn't choose sides, he just tells you the way he believes it to be. And I think that one of the things that we've got to deal with over the next uh, few months is to say, well what does this mean for Mexican democracy, what does it mean for Mexican federalism, and what does it mean for the relationship between the Mexican government and uh, Mexican civil society and the private sector. No one knows until the president sits in that chair and, we, and he begins and he takes office. But it's important to be aware and be informed of the makeup of uh, not only his team, but also understand the philosophy and what's behind the thinking of an Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador presidency. We're at a very, very interesting inflection point in Mexican history. I've titled my presentation, Back to the Future. And the reason for that is because a lot of what we're about to see, we've seen before. And I believe that Andres Manuel López Obrador, when he takes over the presidency of Mexico on December the 1st, will begin to implement his plans for returning Mexico to what he sees as a golden era. A golden era in which the central government had the power, the capacity, the bandwidth to be able to govern. Andres Manuel is a man deeply steeped in history. He's written books on Mexican history. He makes historical references all the time, both explicitly and implicitly through symbolism. And we'll talk a little bit about that in this presentation. But one of the most compelling things about him is, of course, his popularity. And when we see how Andres Manuel has uh, has won, has captured the minds of Mexicans. It's a really, truly extraordinary phenomenon. The election that took place on July the 1st of 2018 saw Andres Manuel win every single state in the country except for the state of Guanajuato, that blue blob in the middle there. That was won by his rival, Ricardo Anaya, from the Pan Party. And if we think about the election results that took place uh, here in the United States on Tuesday, the map that we've become so familiar with, where you see a lot of blue on the coast and a lot of red in the middle, well, that used to be the case in Mexico as well. As you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, you see that uh, in the 2000 election, you saw the blue pan party dominating the north of the country and the pre, the red there, dominating the south. In 2006, we saw the PAN dominating the North, the left-wing PRD dominating the South. In 2012, the PRI dominated the North and some states in the South, but there was a big patch of yellow there from the PRD and a, a smaller patch of blue from the PAN. Mexico has been divided between political parties and between candidates for a long time, but Andres Manuel López Obrador this year had a landslide tidal wave victory. And you will never see that kind of map in the United States of America. You're not going to see a red tide or a blue tide sweeping over the entire country. Or at least we don't think so. And people thought the same thing in Mexico up until this year. It's a truly extraordinary phenomenon. 
Mexicans were ready for Andrés Manuel. They were ready for his message. They were ready for his message of hope as much as anything. And they were also ready to kick out the guys who, they, in their opinion, had done such a bad job. There was disenchantment, disillusionment with the PRI and the PAN. And to give you a better idea of how dramatic this victory was, Andrés Manuel won with 53% of the popular vote. No other president in modern democratic history in Mexico has achieved that kind of result. 53% of Mexicans voted for him. At a certain point in the campaign, there was discussion about one of the rival candidates dropping out so that his votes could go to the other guy. It wouldn't have made any difference. Andrés Manuel had an absolute majority of the votes. This gives him an enormous legitimacy. It means that he will have an extended honeymoon period. It means that this tidal wave of power, of support for him in the country, gives him nationwide legitimacy. Everybody voted for Andrés Manuel. And if that wasn't enough, he controls the Congress. Both chambers of Congress, he won very strong majorities. And in fact, since the election, he's managed to pull together a coalition, which means that he has a super majority in the Chamber of Deputies. And in the Senate, he's very, very close to having a super majority, something that he can probably negotiate with those senators that he needs to vote for him. And why does a super majority matter? Well, if you have two thirds of the votes in both chambers of Congress, the path is clear for you to change the constitution in Mexico. There's one, factor that you, one other factor that you need there, and I'll talk about that in a second. At the level of the governorships, there were nine gubernatorial elections in Mexico this summer. The Morena party, Andrés Manuel's party, won five out of nine. This was the first time they've won governorships, and over the next three years, they're gonna win more. And my prediction is that by 2021, Andrés Manuel's party, the Morena party, will control a majority of the state governorships. One factor, or one element that people don't really discuss very much in Mexico is the state level legislatures because people think they're not that important because the governors have really been the dominant figures at the local level. But the state legislators matter because if you have a majority of the state legislators, that's the factor that you need alongside the supermajority in both chambers of Congress to be able to change the constitution. Andrés Manuel and his party won 19 out of 32. In other words, there is no obstacle to Andrés Manuel changing the Mexican constitution, doing whatever he wants to do. And that has a lot of people rather worried in Mexico. As a lot of people who have worked incredibly hard for the energy reform, who worked incredibly hard for the education reform, who worked incredibly hard for fiscal reform, they're now deeply worried that the keys to the kingdom are in Andrés Manuel's hands and nobody can take them away from him for the next six years. What does he want to do with all of this power that he's accumulated? Well, he calls it La Cuarta Transformación de México, the fourth transformation of Mexico. As I said before, Andrés Manuel is a man deeply steeped in Mexican history, and he sees that Mexico has gone through three fundamental transformations as a country. The first of those was the, Revol sorry, was the independence movement back in the early 19th century. Then in the middle of the 19th century, there was the reform period. In the early 20th century, there was the Mexican Revolution. And Andrés Manuel believes that Mexico right now is in a period very similar to the revolution of the early 20th century. It's a country that's torn apart by violence. It's a country that is divided by inequality. It's a country which has become ungovernable. And Andrés Manuel wants to govern, he wants to create the institutions, the mechanisms of governance. The Fourth Transformation is an idea which greatly concerns a lot of people because it suggests a radical change in the country. Andrés Manuel has said that we have also said that uh, we are going to achieve this transformation without violence in a peaceful manner. And he's already done that through winning a democratic election in July of this year. We've said that it's going to be an orderly transformation, but it's going to be deep and it's going to be radical. And that last word, radical, is one of those words that Anders Manuel likes to use and which makes a lot of people extremely nervous. 
He has power, but one of the most important mechanisms that he is using right now to achieve this fourth transformation is his political party, the Morena Party. Morena stands for the Movement for National Regeneration. It's a very new party. It's only been around since 2014. Before that, it was a movement. And to be honest with you, it remains a movement. Andres Manuel founded this party between 2011 and 2013 by traveling around the country, going to every single municipality in Mexico. He is the only Mexican presidential candidate, the only Mexican president, and I would bet he's probably the only Mexican politician who has visited every single municipality in the country. And between 2011 and 2013, as he traveled around the country, he set up a little stall, a little tent in every town square in Mexico. And he invited Mexicans to come in to firmar acuerdos, to sign agreements with him. And his question was, do you think that Mexico could be better? Would you like to see a fairer, safer, more just, more prosperous, more equal Mexico? And everybody said yes. And he said, I don't mind whether you are from the left or the right, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're a priest or a panista or a pererista, come and join my movement because we're trying to make Mexico a better place. This is a genius move in so many ways. One, it's grassroots politics at its purest, right? He went to the people and he brought them inside. Secondly, he created a cell structure for his election campaign in 2018, whereby he already knew exactly who would support his movement. He was able to go back to them. He had community organizers. It was a genius move and it worked exceptionally well. The Morena party is an umbrella party. It embraces people from across the political spectrum and it has incorporated new people since it won the election. People from the left, from the right, who have joined the movement, joined the party, because of course that's where the power is. And Andres Manuel wants this party to be a hegemonic party. And here in the United States, speaking your version of English, which I greatly admire, um, we would use the term hegemony in a way to say, it's about dominance, overwhelming dominance. But Andres Manuel comes from left-wing roots. And in the left-wing movements in Mexico and around the world, that's not the understanding of hegemony that they have. They trace hegemony back to an Italian philosopher called Antonio Gramsci. And some of you in the room may have read some Gramsci at some point in your lives. And Gramsci tried to explain in the early 20th century how the Italian state dominated the people. And he said, it dominates not by coercion, but by consent. The definition that he used was that, you know, this is the dominance of an actor or a group, not by coercion, but by consent. So that people come to see it as the necessary order of things. It becomes incorporated into your psyche. Andres Manuel wants the Morena party to be a hegemonic party whereby the people have already given their consent, whereby the people say, our will is the same as the will of the party. And where did he get such a crazy idea? Well, he got that from Mexican history. The creation of the pre-party in the post-revolutionary period, a party which was an umbrella party, a party which was designed to bring people together to overcome the deep divisions of the Mexican revolution of the violence that tore the country apart. And as Andres Manuel looks back at history and he sees what was able to be achieved by the PRI as a party in the mid 20th century, he said, we need something similar today. We need a party which unites us. And the big problem with democratization in Mexico is that we have been divided one from another. A competitive party system is by its nature competitive and creates conflict. So his idea is, let's all come back under the one tent again, under the one roof. Let's sort out our problems, not in public, but in private. The PRI is the model, and that's why some people have said the fourth transformation is not really the fourth transformation of Mexico, but in fact it's the fourth transformation of the party structure in Mexico. Post-revolution, you had a party created called the PRM, which transformed into the PNR, which transformed into the PRI, and now has been transformed into the Morena Party. Now, 
The pre-party still exists. It's greatly weakened. They have minimal representation in the National Congress. They still have a large number of governorships, but my prediction is they will lose control of those governorships over the next couple of years. Morena does stand in a truly dominant position in Mexico's party politics at this point in time. So what does Andrés Manuel want to do with all of this power? He wants the fourth transformation? Yes. But what does that actually mean? One of the most important and poignant moments of election night, and I was lucky enough to be in the Zocalo watching Andrés Manuel that night on July 1st. One of the most poignant moments was when he got up onto the stage and in between the screams of support from the Mexican people who were there, around 100,000 Mexicans gathered in the Zocalo, the world's second largest square after Red Square, he stood up there and he said, I want to be a good president. Quiero ser un buen presidente. And I truly believe that Andrés Manuel wants to be a good president. In fact, I think he wants to be a great president. He wants to go down in history as one of the great presidents. And why do I believe that? Because of all of the historical references that he makes. He makes references to Benito Juárez. He makes references to Francisco Madero. He makes references to Lázaro Cárdenas. These are his historical heroes. And he wants to be in the pantheon of great Mexican leaders. Which means that he wants to leave behind a legacy. This is not about a six-year term. This is not about just being president. Now that he's won power, he wants to change the country. Morena as a party, as a hegemonic party, will be part of that answer. But in the short term, during his presidency, he sees that he has one priority. And that priority is to centralize power as much as possible. And the centralization of power in the Mexican government. Ay, por qué? Yeah. The centralization of power in the Mexican government takes three main forms. First of all, Andrés Manuel had it as a goal that he wanted to control Congress. But honestly, if you asked people before the election whether or not his Morena party would get a majority in Congress, almost everybody said no. Even Andrés Manuel said no, he probably wouldn't have a, a majority. He didn't just get a majority, he got almost a super majority across Congress. So he can put a little tick beside that first goal. He controls Congress, he controls it overwhelmingly. Secondly, Andrés Manuel wants to control the governors. I said to you that he now has five governors of his own party. It doesn't matter that the other 27 are from different parties. He called them all together. This is a beautiful picture where Andrés Manuel met with the 32 governors of Mexico shortly after the election. It was a great photo opportunity. It was a lovely moment. Everybody congratulated the president-elect. And then, over the next few weeks, Andrés Manuel met with every single governor individually. A nice little handshake, a photo opportunity, and then behind the scenes, the message was sent loud and clear. I'm the boss. I'm the new boss. And you're going to work for me now. It doesn't matter whether you're from my party or from another party. And if the message wasn't clear enough, Andrés Manuel has announced a plan to send out delegates, representatives from his own presidential office to each of the states. These people are called the Coordinadores Estatales de Programas de Desarrollo, the state coordinators for development programs. And what is their job? Their job is to tell the governors how they can spend the money that they receive from the federal government. Over the last 20 years, we've seen a progressive devolution of power, in particular of fiscal power, from the federal government in Mexico to the governors. Block grants that are given each year to the governors and they spend it however uh, they, they choose to. Without any kind of accountability, with minimal transparency, and Andrés Manuel has identified this as being a major problem in Mexico. In public, he says it's because of corruption, waste and inefficiency. But what he really means is that governors have become too independent, governors have become too powerful. And so by sending out his coordinators, or what people in Mexico are now calling los virreyes, the viceroys, he will control governors in the most direct form possible through the power of the purse. The governor will not spend money unless Andrés Manuel says it's okay. This is 
pure politics. This is raw politics. This is Andres Manuel's exercise of power. Lastly, Andres Manuel has announced a very ambitious plan for controlling Mexico's public service. He calls it a program of austeridad republicana, republican austerity. And he justifies it by saying that we are going to cut government spending by cutting the salaries of the high-level officials in Mexican government. First of all, he announced that he would cut 70% of the positions held by altos funcionarios de confianza, the high-level political appointees. So they're now gone, 70% of them. He then said that he's going to cut salaries. Early on, he announced that he would uh, cut the salary of the presidency in half already. Andrew Manuel is going to make around $5,000 a month as president. And no public servant can make more money than the president. So if you have a high-ranking Mexican official who's been making $100,000 or $120,000 a year, they're now going to be making less than $60,000 a year. In addition to that, Andres Manuel has announced that he's going to cut benefits. No private health insurance anymore for government officials. No nice little perks like a cell phone or a driver. If you were working in the Mexican public service and your salary got slashed in that way, what would you do? Well, it depends on your financial situation, I guess, but you're probably going to start looking for work somewhere else. And if that wasn't enough, he's announced another plan, which he calls the decentralization of government, which goes contradictory to what I've said here, but it's really not decentralization. A better term is the relocation of government. He's announced that federal government agencies will be moved from Mexico City to different states of the republic. The energy ministry will move from Mexico City to the state of Tabasco, because that's where energy happens. The National Migration Institute will be moved from Mexico City to Tijuana. Why does this matter? Imagine, you work in the Mexican public service and you're quite happy living in Mexico City because that's where a lot of the services are and great infrastructure and all of a sudden you're told you have to move to Tabasco. Well, maybe you say, fine, I need to keep my job, I'll do it. But you're not going to be happy. But what if? You work in the energy ministry and your spouse works in the Migration Institute. And all of a sudden, you're going to be in Tabasco and your spouse is going to be in Tijuana. Where do the kids go? As I like to say, there are some couples who would see this as a dream solution to their marital problems. <laughs> but if you're happily married and if you are a traditional Mexican family, that's probably not going to fly. Your salary's been cut. Your benefits have been cut. And now you have to live in another city, potentially on the other end of the country from your spouse. This is a real challenge. And you might be thinking, why would he want to attack the public service? Why would he want to attack the very people he's going to need to implement his policies? Well, Andres Manuel believes that the Mexican public service will pose a resistance to him. In the United States, the term deep state has become popular. He doesn't use that terminology, but it's kind of how he thinks. He sees that the Mexican bureaucracy is full of technocrats, people who are committed to the neoliberal program of the last 25 to 30 years. He'd like to clear them out. And this is one way of doing it, a rather brutal way of doing it. But of course, if you were truly loyal to Mexico, then wouldn't you stay? The money isn't important. His advisors have come out publicly and said, this is a matter of morality. When we have 50 million people living in poverty in Mexico, we can't afford to have high salaries in government. Well, maybe you can't afford not to have high salaries in government because those people are going to leave now. But how will Mexican government function? Well, over the next couple of years, a new cadre of Mexican functionaries, public servants, is going to be created. The Morena Party has created its own school for Morenistas, a university which is in part training people to be public servants, and in part it's an indoctrination program into the principles of the party. This sounds very ominous. Every political party in Mexico has these kind of things, but they've never said that this is to train people for public service. So what I think is going to happen here is you're going to see a cleaning out 
of some of the most important agencies in the Mexican government, in particular the Treasury, the Economy Secretariat, the Central Bank. People are already leaving from the Central Bank. And within a couple of years, a new group of functionaries will come in. This doesn't just matter for Andrés Manuel's presidential term. It matters long term for Mexico. The people who come in to replace those who are leaving will be there for the next 20 years. This is a long-term legacy. This is about leaving a mark far beyond six years. If we begin to look at who Andrés Manuel is going to work with in his cabinet, it's a mixed picture. I always try to be as balanced as possible, but if you look at the economic team, it's actually a very good economic team. You have people like Carlos Ozua, who is going to be the uh, Secretary of the Treasury. You have people like Graciela Marquez, who is the Secretary of the Economy. Jesus Seade, who was his chief NAFTA negotiator. These are all very reasonable people. They follow orthodox economic principles. They are slightly to the left of center, no doubt. But they understand the importance of issues like an independent central bank. Fiscal responsibility. Not expropriating private property, etc. I don't have any concerns about those people, but some of the other figures who are in this cabinet concern me greatly. For example, the person who is being put in charge of the Secretaría de Función Pública, which is the uh, government agency which deals with governmental corruption, is somebody who is an ardent, radical follower of Andrés Manuel for many, many years, is an anti-establishment academic who believes that the system is rotten and she's going to chase it down and eliminate all of the corruption that's in there. Not that there's anything wrong with that. That should happen. But the fact is she has a personal axe to grind with many of the people who have been in power over the last 20 years or so. What's more, her husband, a man called John Ackerman, is one of the most radical voices in the Mexican intellectual sphere. His parents are American, hence the name. But he's actually one of the most vehemently anti-American Mexican academics is out there, anti-establishment. And just by the way, he's one of the people who's going to be running that school for modernistas that I just mentioned. This suggests that within the Mexican cabinet that will take over on December 1st, there are deep divisions. And you might ask, well, how does a house divided stand? Well, one of the most important factors here is the role of the chief of staff. As we've seen in the United States over the last two years, having a strong and effective chief of staff makes a huge difference in terms of the efficacy that the executive branch can, uh, can enjoy. Andrés Manuel believes that he needs to have two chiefs of staff. The chief of staff that he named early on is a man called Alfonso Poncho Romo, a very successful Monterrey-based businessman, made a huge amount of money, and became Andrés Manuel's leading business advisor over the past few years. He has assumed the mantle of chief of staff, but it's really outward looking. He negotiates with the Mexican private sector, with international investors, etc. He's a very reasonable man. If you ever get the chance to sit down and talk to him, you will have a meeting of minds because he gets business. And he's one of the most important figures in holding the cabinet together, but also making sure that Andrés Manuel does, the, does not desert his commitment to orthodox economic approaches. On the other side of the screen, a man called Lázaro Cárdenas Batel. Lázaro Cárdenas is the grandson of Mexican President Lázaro Cárdenas, the man who nationalized the oil industry back in 1938. Lázaro Cárdenas is a very reasonable man. He's a good personal friend of mine. He's been living in Washington for the last 10 years. He's a left-winger. He was with the PRD party. He was the governor of Michoacán in the early 2000s. And Lázaro has got perhaps the most difficult job right now because he's been named Jefe de Asesores or Coordinador de Asesores, which literally translated means the chief advisor. But what it really means in practice is he's going to have to mediate between all of those different warring factions within the cabinet. The more radical elements, the more uh, orthodox elements. And it's going to be a heck of a job for him. If these two men stick with it, and if they're successful, then I think we might see a more coordinated and successful approach from Andrés Manuel. But if not, I do have my concerns. Let's talk about the question of public security, organized crime, an issue which I know matters a great deal uh, to you all here. 
Andres Manuel has appointed somebody called Alfonso Durazo. Alfonso Durazo is a relatively well-known uh, public figure in Mexico. He's worked in the area of public security for a number of years uh, with pre-governments and with pan-governments. And he has been named to head up the newly reformed Secretariat of Public Security, the SSP, in Mexico. The SSP was disbanded in 2012 by President Enrique Peña Nieto. He rolled it into the Interior Ministry. Andrés Manuel says, no, this is an important enough issue that it should stand on its own. And I actually agree with that decision. I think it's the, it's the smart thing to do. Alfonso Durazo has worried a lot of people, though, because the public messages he's given have suggested that perhaps he's not quite prepared, at least just yet, to take over this mantle. Mexico, Mexico as some of you know, has experienced uh, a recent very, very strong uptick in violence over the last three years. At the beginning of the Enrique Peña Nieto administration, of course, there was a, a quite sharp decline in the homicide rate in Mexico. But after the midterms in, in Mexico, it picked up again. And so the homicide rate in Mexico is now somewhere between 21 and 22 per 100,000. Alfonso Durazo made an announcement early on. He said, Mexico is an OECD nation. The OECD average for homicides is four per 100,000. Within three years, I will bring down the homicide rate to four per 100,000. It's a wonderful thing to say, and we all hope he can do it, but nobody sees how that is humanly possible. Particularly when a national security plan has not been announced. It was supposed to be announced earlier on this week, and there are deep divisions within the cabinet over what that looks like, and so it's gonna be delayed until at least next week. But even if they had a clear plan, I'm not sure that there is very much that can be done at this point of time with an organized crime environment in Mexico which is constantly morphing, where we've seen the fragmentation of the major cartels, where we've seen the emergence of new powerful criminal actors in Mexico, where we've seen a diversification of the income streams of the cartels, and where because of the prevailing conditions of impunity across the country, where if you commit a murder, you have a 1% chance of going to jail. Murder has become much more common, not just within organized crime, but within disorganized crime as well. Violent crime, the use of, of firearms in robberies, in kidnappings, has meant that it's now not just criminal groups like the cartels that are killing people, it is petty criminal, criminals, gangs, bad guys on the streets. Andres Manuel said earlier on in the campaign that he would take the Mexican military, the, the Navy and the Army, off the streets. Thank goodness, since winning the election, he's had a chance to look at the reality of Mexico. As we say in American English, he's had a chance to look under the hood in Mexico. They say, they say he's lifted the veil of the bride that he's married, and he's begun to realize that that is, in fact, impossible. You cannot take the military off the streets of Mexico at this point in time because you would create a vacuum of power and chaos. He's talked about the creation of a Guardia Civil or a Guardia Nacional, a new military police force that will respond to organized crime and other problems across the country. I fear that we've heard these kind of ideas before and they haven't been adequately funded. Can he make it work if he's willing to dedicate the fiscal resources to make that happen? But in fact, He's talking about this Republican austerity. He's cutting back on government spending. That's a real problem, in my opinion. The last idea that Andrew Manuel has talked about is police reform. And every president talks about police reform. But Andrew Manuel has committed himself to the Mando Unico, a unified command structure for Mexico's thousands of police forces. Maybe even uniting municipal police forces into state police forces. As I said, other presidents have tried to do this, and they've always failed. Andres Manuel might just be able to pull this off. He controls the Congress, and he controls the governors. So if he wants to, he can make this happen. The big question is, is that the solution to the problem that faces him? I've talked already about his economic program, but let me just uh, point out this man on the screen, Carlos Ozua. He's a good guy. He's a very smart Mexican intellectual and academic from the Colegio de Mexico. He interacts well with investors. 
he sends the right message. When I got the chance to host him at the Wilson Center earlier on this year and to talk privately with him afterwards, he said that his number one job during the election campaign was to reassure investors that Andrews Manuel was not going to destroy the economy. And the day after the election, on July 2nd, he held a conference call with investors in which he laid out the orthodox economic policies of the government. But he didn't really talk so much about the more populist elements of economic policy that Anders Manuel has espoused. In particular, economic nationalism. Anders Manuel does not want to import food from overseas. He wants Mexico to be independent in food production. Those of you who live in McAllen should understand how important those food exports are from the United States to Mexico. Now, this is not something you can achieve overnight. You just don't suddenly create food production in Mexico, but that's his long-term goal. Andrew Manuel has also talked about not being energy dependent on the United States, would like to stop importing natural gas from the US, would like to stop importing refined products from the United States. The slogan that is used within the Morena Party is vamos a producir, we are going to produce, and they want to produce in Mexico. Other populist elements focus on increasing old age pensions, in providing free university education, and in providing a monthly allowance to the ninis, los que ni trabajan ni estudian, those who neither study nor work. Young people, sort of between the age of 18 and 25, who would be eligible for a monthly pension of around 3,000 pesos, $150 a month. Andres Manuel says this is to keep them out of the hands of organized crime. They need to have some money. If my employer decides to pay me $150 a month from this point on, I'm turning to organized crime. In fact, it'll be disorganized because I'm terribly disorganized. I'm an absent-minded professor, but it will be crime nonetheless. I cannot support my lavish lifestyle on $150 a, a month. One big problem that comes out of these more populist elements is how are they all going to be financed? Andres Manuel has, uh, has said that the answer to that is eliminating corruption. By eliminating corruption, he will find this magic treasure chest which has been hidden away for so many years. I've had conversations with some people in his team who say, you don't understand, Duncan. There are billion dollar pots of money left, right and center that the current government has been hiding. And I say, well, why haven't they either stolen it or spent it? That's what governments do, isn't it? And they say, no, 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 you don't understand. They've got it, they've got it saved away for a rainy day. I'm like, okay. They've been looking for the money, they haven't found it so far. And they've begun to scale back their predictions in terms of how much money they will save by fighting corruption. It used to be that they would save 220 billion pesos. Now they're saying, well, no, we're not going to save that much, and it's not all going to come from fighting corruption, it's going to be by reducing inefficiency and waste, and like, that's fine. But are you going to be able to find this money? That's what I want to know. And I don't see any evidence that they really can find that money. But this leads to a question. If there are fundamental flaws in his economic program, does Andrus Manuel really care about the economy? And we have recent and compelling evidence that perhaps it's not his priority. And that is because of what happened in the Consulta Publica or public referendum about Mexico's new international airport project. Seen here on the screen, this beautiful design by a British architect, Norman Foster. I flew over it the other day and it looks exactly like that built in the middle of what remains of Lake, Lake Texcoco. Andres Manuel has said this is a terrible project. It's environmentally damaging. The poor little patitos, the ducks that live there, won't have a home anymore. Well, they don't have a home anymore, Andres Manuel, because it's already been built, basically. The runways are in, at least the foundations are there. But he says it's also been a den of iniquity, a nest of corruption, and we need to cancel it. It's not the best thing for Mexico City, and I have an idea to develop other airports that will be much better for Mexico City. He said, but this is a $13 billion project, Andres Manuel, and between three and four billion dollars have already been spent, and people have contracts which you have to honor, and you're gonna to have to pay them off if you cancel those contracts. I don't care about that. We've got the money, and we will compensate them. The private sector doesn't need to worry about that. He said, well, that's one problem. But the other big problem is, what does that say to international investors and national investors about how you're going to run the economy? 
Andrés Manuel then said, so we'll ask the Mexican public. We'll have a consulta pública. Let's ask the people what they think, because the people are wise. The people aren't tonto. And so he conducted his consulta pública, his referendum. There were a million ballots cast in that referendum. Strangely enough, only 500,000 ballots were printed, but that's fine. <laughs> they set up tables in town squares in strategically chosen parts of Mexico, where they would ask people, what do you think, yes or no? Now, in public opinion polls that have been taken before the consulta pública, people were asked, do you think we should continue with the existing airport project or should we abandon it to do something else? And 70% of Mexicans said we should continue with the existing airport project. In the referendum, the consulta pública that was held, 70% of people said we should abandon the existing airport project. I fail to see how Mexican public opinion shifted that much unless you were asking all of the right people. The consulta pública scares a lot of people. It resonates of many of the things that people like Hugo Chavez, Nicolas Maduro have done in Venezuela. And on the night that the referendum result was announced, that Andrés Manuel committed to cancelling the airport because the people had said that's what he needs to do, on a nationally televised show, the head of one of the business associations, Coparmex, was there and he was ranting and raving about how terrible this was and it was illegal, etc. And the president of the Mexican Chamber of Deputies, a Morena politician called Mario Delgado, sat there calmly and said, you don't like the consulta pública? You'd better get used to it because we're introducing legislation to make it much easier to have these referendums on a recurring basis on any issue we wish. That's what the future holds, is that there are going to be referendums on all kinds of issues. And although right now that doesn't conform to the Mexican constitution because you can only have referendums on non-fiscal issues, they're going to change the constitution to make that happen. Because Andrés Manuel has learned that if you want to govern, and you want to govern in a way that the people accept, then you need consent, right? That's what the Gramscian definition of hegemony is all about. And so he will regularly consult with the people including on his own presidency. He has committed to have a referendum in 2021 on whether or not the Mexican public is happy with his presidency. Let me predict an outcome of that referendum at this point in time. I would say 70% of Mexicans will say they really are quite happy with Andrés Manuel. So why did he do all of this? As I said, does he really care about the economic consequences? Probably not. And somebody wrote an op-ed recently in Mexico, just last weekend, that I thought summed it up very well. They said, look, you're all ranting and raving because you're thinking about the economic consequences. You employ an economic logic. You were trained at Mexico's elite universities where they teach you Chicago-style economics, neoliberalism. Well, guess what? Andrés Manuel doesn't think that way. Economic logic is secondary to political logic, and political logic dictates that when you come into power, you need to exercise power. And guess what? There's a new sheriff in town. And Andrés Manuel did all of this to say, I'm in charge. Will he repeat it? Will he do other damaging things to the Mexican economy? Because after the announcement of the cancellation of the airport, the Mexican peso slid from 18 to the dollar to over 20 to the dollar within a matter of days. The Mexican stock exchange took a battering. Well, since then, his Morena party has announced new legislation that will eliminate the commissions that banks are allowed to charge on transactions. Eliminate them. The folks at IBC Bank, I think, would really welcome that kind of policy here in the United States. Over the past few days, the Mexican stock exchange has taken another battering, dropping between 5 and 7 percent, in particular, obviously, the bank stocks. Andres Manuel doesn't care about the economic consequences of that in the short term. His standard response is, eh, the markets are overreacting. They'll come back. Let's talk about an issue which matters a great deal to many people here in the room, energy. The woman on your screen is Rocio Nale. She is President-elect uh, Lopez Obrador's pick to be Secretary of Energy. She's a compelling figure, let's put it that way. She's from the state of Veracruz, deeply rooted in Veracruz politics, deeply rooted 
in Pemex, the National Oil Company. She's a petrochemical engineer by training, which would suggest that she knows something about the energy ministry, or sorry, the energy business. In the conversations that I've had with her, she knows a lot about the technicalities, but she's not so sure about how you finance energy. And as we all know, that's a critical component without which you can do nothing. She's a bit, little bit fuzzy on timelines in energy. She believes that you can raise Mexican oil production from its current position around 1.8 million barrels a day up to 2.5 million barrels a day within two years. It's physically, humanly impossible to do that, but she convinced Andres Manuel that it was possible and he made a major public announcement along those lines. She believes that you can build a new refinery in three years. And the response is, well, yeah, you can if you begin the three-year period after you've got all the permitting and if you've got the land and you've already prepared the foundations and all the other things and you've got the right construction company. But you're not going to build a, a new refinery, which is one of her pet projects. You're not going to build a refinery in the next three years in Mexico because it takes a lot longer than that. And just as a point of reference, back in 2009, the Calderon government announced they were going to build a new refinery in Tula Hidalgo. To this day, there is a very nice fence around the terreno, around the piece of land, and nothing inside. More worrying than the fact that she doesn't seem to have a clear grasp of the fundamentals of the energy business is the people that she has appointed to run key agencies. Her undersecretary, for example, and there will only be one undersecretary of energy, unlike the three that we have right now, there will only be one undersecretary of energy in the new government, and his name is Alberto Montoya. He's a radical figure from the Morena party. The one video that everybody has seen of him is of him giving a conferencia magistral, a keynote address, where he begins by saying, let me just say, I believe that capitalism is an aberrant system. Doesn't really instill a lot of confidence in the private sector. To head up Pemex, Andres Manuel and Rocio Nali have appointed Octavio Romero. Octavio Romero is one of the longest term confidants and advisors to Andres Manuel from the state of Tabasco. He has no background in the energy business. He's an agronomo, an agricultural economist by, by training. Andrew Manuel has him there because, at least publicly, he says he wants him to eliminate the corruption within the National Oil Company. The real reason is, Andrew Manuel will have his man in place. His confidant, his advisor, Andrew Manuel wants to control Pemex because of the importance it holds for fiscal revenue and for the energy sector. For the National Electricity Utility, CFE, Manuel Bartlett, an 82-year-old nationalistic, former priesta, former Workers' Party, now Morena Party politician, is there to run a company which has been transformed over the last five years from being a monopoly into a collection of smaller companies that tries to compete in a market setting with private electricity generation firms in Mexico. Again, I'm not quite sure what his credentials are to run an electricity utility, except that he's very famous in Mexico for screaming blue murder any time any foreigner talks about energy in Mexico. Just talking about it, he considers to be a violation of Mexican sovereignty. What is the prospect for US-Mexico relations? Before the election, a lot of people were very worried that Andres Manuel, a, a radical, firebrand, leftist politician, would almost immediately get into a bronca, a dispute with President Trump. It didn't quite work out that way, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Andres Manuel's appointment of, uh, for Foreign Secretary, the Canciller, Marcelo Ebrard, a former mayor of Mexico City, who was at one time seen as being an acolyte of Andres Manuel. Then he became a rival, now he's back in the fold very reasonable, centrist, slightly to the left of center politician, who is very knowledgeable and actually does understand foreign policy and has already developed a good relationship with Jared Kushner and with many members of President Trump's cabinet. That leads me to think that things are actually not going to be as bad as many people have suggested. But let's, let's reserve judgment for the time being. Certainly during the transition period, the negotiation of the USMCA or TMEC agreement between Mexico, the United States and Canada, Andrew Manuel supported that. He understood that NAFTA, North America, is an existential issue for Mexico and that he wouldn't have success without it. 
And so he told his chief negotiator, Jesus Seade, to support everything that the current Mexican government was doing, with the exception of the chapter on energy. The chapter on energy, which made a specific reference to the Mexican energy reform of 2013, he insisted that was changed. And now there is a reference to the inherent right of every nation to control its own oil and gas reserves. Not that you need to be worried about that, because it just, well, that's the reality. They do have the sovereign right to control them, absolutely, according to their constitutions. But Andrew Manuel didn't want to have any reference to the energy reform of 2013 because he doesn't like it. On migration and Central America, the new team has actually been quite positive with the American administration by saying that they want to work together on Central America. Andrew Manuel wants to work together in Central America. He's proposed a $30 billion development fund for Central America. He doesn't have the money for it. He'd like the Americans to pay for it. And the Americans are not too enthusiastic about that. Uh, the Americans are much more interested in the Mexican state playing a much more active role in stopping Central American migration at Mexico's southern border. But Andrew Manuel is not a huge fan of that idea. That could turn into a nasty dispute very, very quickly, particularly because the Central American caravan will find its way up to the southwest border around the first week of December. President Trump has said that if it gets up to the southwest border, he will shut the border. And he's serious about it. And I think you folks know better than I do what that actually means for your pocketbooks and for your lifestyles. Andres Manuel is not fully comprehending the severity of this situation at this point in time. He's been relatively positive towards the United States in terms of security cooperation, offering to work with the United States. I fear that might change after December 1st. Once he begins to realize how much collaboration, cooperation, intelligence sharing takes place between Mexico and the United States, I fear he's going to say, eh, maybe a bit too much. Let's reel it back in a bit. Not that this is a disaster. This happened back in 2012 when Enrique Peña Nieto became president. He was shocked by the extent of cooperation and wanted to reel it in. On foreign policy, I do see problems. The current Mexican administration has been very vocal in its criticism of Venezuela, of Nicolas Maduro, and has been a good, strong ally of the, of the United States in that. The new government will not do anything like that. In fact, Andres Manuel has invited Nicolas Maduro to his inauguration ceremony, and he has accepted. This will create some clashes. Let's talk about the actual relationship between Andres Manuel and President Trump. As I said, before the election, people thought it was going to be a recipe for disaster. But on election night, President Trump tweeted his congratulations very early on in the evening, around 8.30 Mexican time. The tweet came through congratulating Andres Manuel. A couple of days later, they had a very friendly and extended telephone conversation. And then Andres Manuel pulled a stroke of genius. A stroke of genius by sending a letter to Donald Trump. Who sends a letter to Donald Trump? A seven-page letter, which of course he was never going to read, including details about his economic plan for Mexico, about how he wanted to plant millions of trees in southern Mexico. But the key line in that letter was where Andres Manuel says, you and I have both fought against the establishment our entire lives. It was a way to connect the two men on an emotional level. And Donald Trump responded with a one-page letter that ended, I would be, it would make me very happy if Mexico is a prosperous and successful country. That's exactly what Andres Manuel wanted to have. Not the content of the letter. He wanted a letter in response. And you know why? His big hero, as I said earlier on, is Benito Juarez. Benito Juarez had extensive correspondence, written correspondence, with Abraham Lincoln. And Andres Manuel is looking back at history and says, if, I, if Benito is my role model, I want to pursue the same kind of diplomacy, and it's 19th century diplomacy with President Trump. It works for him. It kind of works for Donald Trump as well. Is this then going to be a bromance? Are these guys going to be besties, BFFs, forever? The problem is, is that there are too many issues over which they can clash. Migration, Central American caravan being the first of those. Security cooperation, 
foreign policy, independence in food production, energy imports into Mexico. There is an ample array of issues there over which they can clash. I do believe that Andrew Manuel wants to avoid that clash at all costs because he doesn't want to focus on the bilateral relationship. He wants to focus internally on his fourth transformation of the country. He wants to make sure that Mexico is remodeled according to his plan. Just a quick word on Texas-Mexico relations. This chart says, uh, shows you everything, right? That Mexico is far and away the biggest recipient of Texas's exports. We know how much Mexico matters to the United States, and we know how much it matters to Texas, and we know how much it matters to McAllen. But it's not just the economy. Of course, there's energy, and those rather daunting plans for the energy sector will impact upon places like McAllen. Investment in the economy. Is Mexico going to be as safe a place to invest now as it was before? I'm worried, and a lot of investors are worried too. Migration. If Andrés Manuel does not continue the policy of the Enrique Peña Nieto government of trying to reduce the flow of Central Americans northwards, it's going to put extra stress and tension on the border. And if Andrés Manuel is unsuccessful in his national security strategy, that means that violence levels could get even worse on the other side of the border. So the question is, will Andrés Manuel López Obrador succeed? Andrés Manuel is an ambitious man. Andrés Manuel has vision. Andrés Manuel wants to be a good or a great president. In some ways, he's already succeeded. He's won the presidency. He's got all the tools of power at his disposal. The keys to the kingdom are in his hands. He's centralizing power as we speak. That's success. But is he going to be successful in terms of leaving behind a positive legacy? A country which is less divided, a country which is more prosperous, a country which is safer. That's a question to which I don't really have an answer, and you'll have to invite me back in a year or two to, to see how we're doing. But I do think that one of the things that we need to emphasize at this point in time is the fundamental importance of ongoing engagement by the United States in Mexico and not just from the federal government. It has to come from state governments. It has to come from municipal governments. It's vitally important that the private sector plays an active role in traveling to Mexico City and engaging with members of the new government. It's vitally important that universities and civil society organizations engage as much as possible. Because Andrés Manuel right now controls the Congress. He controls the governors. He controls the media because they depend upon federal government revenue. He's attacking the private sector. He's attacking civil society. One counterbalance to that can be the role of international investors, of global markets, and from the friends of Mexico to try to make sure that he follows a steady path, a steady course to try to make sure that Mexico continues to be prosperous, because we all care deeply about that, and it's in all of our interests. Thank you for listening to me.